Simon Sterling, thank you very much for accepting this, this invitation. We are honored to have you here. And before giving you the floor, I will read a very short summary of your very, uh, of your amazing career. So Dr. Sterling is a emeritus professor at Louisiana Tech University from 90, 1995 to 2009. He was the CETF professor of civil engineering and director of the Trenches Technology Center at Louisiana Tech University. Dr. Sterling received his engineering degree from the University of Sheffield in 1970 and his master's and PhD degrees from the University of Minnesota in 1975 and 1977, respectively. He's uh, uh, the past chairman of both the International Society of Trenchless Technology and the North American Society for Trenchless Technology. In 2009, he received the gold medal from the International Society for Trenchless Technology. He's a registered engineer in the United States and a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. So Dr. Raymond, thank you very much again. And the floor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. It's a pleasure to be with you all uh, uh, today. And um, uh, I hope that I can provide you some useful information about uh, hijacking and uh, microtunneling. So uh, let me uh, share my screen and pull up the uh, presentation. Um, okay. Um, so um, I have uh, uh, kind of overview of uh, pipe jacking and micro tunneling, some of the history and uh, some of the details of different methods that fall in this family. Uh, and then we'll also talk about uh, some of the main technical challenges uh, with some of the methods and what uh, current research is telling us about the uh, about how to deal with those issues. Uh, and at the end, uh, if there are things I don't cover that you have questions about, please be sure to uh, to ask. So micro tunneling is part of a family of pipe jacking methods. And pipe jacking, uh, first uh, uh, use was thought to be around 1896. And when pipe jacking was started, it was a person entry uh, hand excavation method. In other words, the, the face of the tunnel was being dug by hand and the tunnel was therefore big enough to get a person in to do that work. Uh, and so the, it's uh, in reasonable uh, diameter size tunnels. Um, it's been used in soils uh, and mixed ground um, uh, mainly. Um, and the, with various types of base support and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit uh, later on. And typically, because it was an open face, uh, the original pipe jacking was done typically above the water table. Uh, it uh, was steerable by using some kind of a shield at the, uh, uh, at the face and uh, steering uh, the shield uh, in the same way as you would steer a, a tunnel boring machine. There's another method in the pipe jacking family uh, that's termed auger boring. And uh, this was uh, first used in the 1930s. And it was developed to be able to drill coal seams that were too thin to economically be excavated uh, uh, by um, hand excavation 
uh, techniques. Uh, it's also now used for road crossings. Uh, it involves, uh, if you can see on the uh, right-hand side here, this is a an auger, uh, which is a spiral, uh, uh, like a, a drill piece. And when that's rotated and a cutting face, a cutting head is also rotated, uh, the cutting face will excavate the uh, soft rock or, um, or soil, and the spiral auger will move the soil back to the uh, starting pit. Uh, and um, so because it's an open auger, uh, it's mainly applicable to cohesive soils or soils that will not run freely along the auger. Uh, and it's also used uh, above the water table. Uh, it needs a steel uh, casing while the auger is operating because it's a very uh, abrasive operation. Uh, and also the basic uh, auger boring method doesn't have much steering capability. Um, there are adaptations of the technique now that allow it to be steered more accurately. So pipe jacking and auger boring were the uh, two main types of pipe jacking techniques. Uh, the prior to uh, the other developments, uh, such as micro tunneling, which came along in the around the 1960s. The characteristics of uh, micro tunneling are that rather than um, uh, it being open only to person entry diameters, it is remotely controlled. And so a person in a uh, cabin on the surface can control all of the operations. Um, uh, it also and initially was laser guided, allowing it to follow line and grade very accurately. Uh, and um, being a pipe jacking method, uh, jacked pipes are used to advance the uh, advance the tunnel. And also to be classed as micro tunneling, uh, it's important that the there is good face control and face support. Uh, and so those four characteristics are what really make up uh, uh, micro tunneling. Um, but as you can imagine from the name, uh, the, initially the name was based on the size. So um, micro tunneling was uh, tunneling when the diameter of the tunnel did not allow people to go inside, which is typically around 0.9 to one meter. And so if you were going to tunnel below that, it had to be remotely controlled. <clears throat> um, the, I should also mention in that, that now, at particularly in North America, I'm not sure of about in Mexico, uh, the definition is more about the method than the size. So in other words, the idea is that if it can be completed in a remote controlled fashion, uh, then it can be termed micro tunneling. Um, so let's look across the um, various trenchless excavation methods because if you want to uh, consider a method doing pipe jacking or micro tunneling, uh, it's important to know what the uh, other options are. And so it, this diagram shows you some of the other techniques. We're not going to talk about them today, but uh, I'll just mention them for, for reference. Uh, there are the displacement techniques that include impact molding and uh, pipe ramming. Uh, these uh, uh, basically push their way through the ground and push the ground uh, to the side. Impact molding does it for the whole pipe 
uh, cross section. Pipe ramming does it uh, only for the thickness of the wall. And then there are the drilling techniques. I'm sure you've been exposed to those, the horizontal directional drilling. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the conventional tunneling techniques. And uh, there's quite a bit of overlap now between, uh, say, pipe jacking and uh, micro-tunneling and tunneling techniques in those uh, sort of small to mid uh, diameters. But the tunneling techniques are typically used for major infrastructure projects such as uh, you know, roads and metros and uh, rail projects. And the uh, trenchless methods more aimed at the uh, utility scale. But there is some, some overlap. Um, pipe jacking techniques are where we're focusing on today. Uh, and then in the middle here, there are some what have termed hybrid techniques. Uh, and I'll describe those when, when I've got a slide that will help explain those more. <clears throat> so what are the difference between the pipe jacking methods and, and ordinary tunneling methods? Well, the, the main difference uh, is that uh, both for the same diameter, if you like, both the tunneling method and pipe jacking method have to overcome the face pressure, uh, which if the geology doesn't change, you wouldn't expect the face pressure to change very much along the length of the drive. And tunneling methods that build their um, that build their tunnel lining as you go, and then you push the tunnel boring machine off the front of that, and the tunnel lining does not move through the ground, that maximum axial thrust that you need stays pretty constant. But with the pipe jacking methods, you have to thrust the uh, pipe also through the ground. So the further you go, the more you would expect the axial thrust to increase. And that gives a, a much firmer limit on length that you can go with pipe jacking methods than would be the case for tunneling methods. <clears throat> Let me deal uh, first with a um, uh, couple of the hybrid methods that I mentioned just to give you the idea that they, these methods can be uh, you know, modified. <clears throat> uh, first I'm gonna talk about is the pilot tube method. Um, in that, it, you, it's sort of a hybrid of directional drilling and, um, and micro tunneling. And you can see initially you push a, um, uh, and rotate a hollow tube with a slant base bit on the on the front. Just as in directional drilling, when you rotate that slant base, it's going to go more or less straight. But when you stop the rotation <coughs> and push, then it's going to deviate. And by looking down this hollow tube uh, to a target near the front, uh, then you can see uh, how closely you're following the, uh, uh, the guidance, uh, and you can adjust the direction using the slant face. So the idea is that if you're going between two shafts, you can get an accurate connection between the two. And then after that, you use an auger-based technique to uh, widen out that initial pilot hole uh, and then when you've got the hole wide enough, then you uh, push out the temporary steel pipes uh, and you replace it with the, um, with the product pipe. So that's more steps than doing the whole job with, in a single pass. Uh, but some of the advantages are that you uh, 
reduce the maximum amount of thrust that you have to provide at any one time. Uh, and also you can reduce the size of the uh, shafts. So uh, especially in where you're able to have closer space shafts, uh, then this method can be um, a fairly cost effective. And also pilot tube method is also used as a pre-guidance for other trenchless methods, uh, such as the auger boring or pipe ramming even. The other hybrid method is, um, uh, it's uh, trade name, if you like, is the direct pipe method uh, and was developed by Heron Connect uh, in the, um, uh, North American Society, uh, NASTT, have, in their guidance, they have a um, more generic uh, name uh, for this method uh, now, but uh, this is where it, where it came from. That's also a combination of uh, directional drilling and microtunneling. Uh, the difference is that uh, it uses a welded steel pipe so where you weld up the pipe into a continuous string, and you also weld on the front a micro tunneling machine. And in this bottom picture here, you can see the micro tunneling machine on the front of a continuous uh, steel pipeline. And the thrust comes by gripping the outside of the pipeline and then pushing, providing the, the axial thrust to allow that uh, pipe and the machine on the front to move forward. So that gives you uh, uh, very high thrust capabilities. Uh, also, um, your hole that you're creating with the micro tunneling machine is being uh, more or less filled with, except for a small axial gap with the pipe. So very little chance of borehole collapse uh, as there may be say with the in directional drilling in some kinds of soil. So uh, it offers some advantages uh, uh, over, uh, over directional drilling and um, yeah, under cir different circumstances. Probably if Circumstances are good, directional drilling will be much cheaper. Uh, but if the circumstances require it, this is uh, also a very effective method. We can also use micro tunneling uh, as a component of large excavations. And I've shown a few examples uh, here um, the, where small micro tunnels are made to make a, uh, a lining which can support the ground, allowing excavation to be made within it to make a large tunnel. Um, you can also use micro tunneling to uh, provide a guidance for large scale pipe jacking or structure jacking. And one of the problems with jacking large structures is that it's very difficult to control the precise alignment of those. And in this method, a micro tunnel is used to actually pour a guidance rail. Here it's just for jacking the, the roof and here for uh, jacking this arch shape uh, piece. And on the right is uh, a tunnel in China, Southern China uh, which used a whole series of uh, quite large micro tunnels to create uh, a large uh, tunnel about 20 meters uh, across. <clears throat> there are also the possibility to uh, use, um, uh, to make specialized cross sections. <clears throat> and these uh, may be either in the uh, done with pipe jacking, or they may be done with conventional uh, tunneling. And for the trenchless aspects of those, uh, some of the um, 
uh, applications, for instance, or particularly in the utility tunnel and pedestrian underpass kinds of projects where it's very uh, nice to have a rectangular uh, cross section. Uh, and also over a circular tunnel, um, you can take up less of the vertical dimension of the underground space, which also in a congested area uh, may be an advantage. <clears throat> Just to show you the, the scale, this is really outside the realm of pipe jacking, but uh, it's a very large uh, structure being jacked uh, under a, uh, a operational uh, railroad, I think it was. Uh, and you can see the jacks here, the scale of those jacks. Uh, altogether, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the jacking forces were enormous, uh, and the, the interjacks provided uh, were about 7,000 uh, tons. The, the um, jacking was 126 meters long, 25 meters wide, and 6 meters high. So <clears throat> it is possible to jack some very large structures uh, through the ground. So let's return to, um, to the micro tunneling. Um, and you know what makes for a low risk versus a high risk micro tunneling project? And I, <clears throat> uh, the authors David Bennett and Kim Staley uh, first to come up with this list. So I borrowed from them. Um, and the uh, a low risk would be where there are no surrounding structures. The entire length is accessible from the surface. Uh, so that if you need to access the machine from the surface, you can. Ground is stable, and the drive lengths are normal for the pipe diameter. So um, <clears throat> that would be a, a low-risk project. It's also a project where maybe you know micro tunneling is not uh, perhaps needed as much, but uh, um, so. Let's look then at the high risk. This would be where you have an unstable ground. <clears throat> you have no access uh, from the surface for the majority of the drive. So that puts a premium on you being sure that you are able to, once you launch the machine, that is going to be able to reach the other end because you won't be able to dig down an emergency shaft to rescue it. <clears throat> and also, if you're looking at very long drive lengths for the uh, pipe size. Um, in order to reduce the risk, we uh, do obviously as good a geotechnical investigation as we can. And one of the things to think about when you compare that to tunneling projects uh, is that uh, a tunneling project of the same length is going to have a much larger budget than a micro tunneling project. Uh, and if you use, as is often done, a percentage uh, roughly of the, of the budget to use for the site investigation, you're gonna have a much smaller budget for the site investigation. But you essentially have the same length of geology to characterize. And also you're going, planning to launch a method uh, that uh, if it's in a smaller diameter may have no access to the face uh, as you uh, work to complete the project. Um, another issue, from um, geotechnical investigations is that, you know, maybe the project started as going to be an open cut sewer pipe, but um, they later on, as they look at the traffic impacts and other uh, environmental impacts, there's a decision, okay, let's do it as a trenchless or micro tunneling project. 
um, when that decision is made, uh, it's important that the geotechnical investigation uh, is either expanded or redone to make sure that it is adequate for a micro tunneling job. <clears throat> and I don't plan to go into the contracting practices in this uh, uh, lecture, but as you may know, if you are involved in tunneling works, that there's been a lot of work over the last several decades <clears throat> to try and make the uh, managing of risk and uh, particularly the geotechnical risk on uh, tunneling projects are more fair to both the owner and the contractor. So the owner doesn't get to say uh, all of the risk is on the contractor, uh, and uh, the uh, owner is also uh, not going to be liable for every small change in, uh, in geotechnical conditions. <clears throat> there are a lot of existing standards about trenchless methods, and uh, they're available uh, across North America and also in Europe and Japan and um, and other places in Asia. So um, if you're thinking about uh, projects, please make sure you avail yourselves of, uh, of these publications. <laughs> um, talking about the, the planning of micro tunneling and pipe jacking project. Uh, it's not just the advancing of the micro tunnel or the uh, pipe jack. Uh, you also uh, need to consider what the depth and the cost and the frequency of the shafts are going to be. Uh, they are often an important cost component of most pipe jacking projects. Um, the, if you are planning to jack long distances, uh, you may decide actually to increase the cost of the shaft uh, to make a large shaft. Uh, may, then that could allow, say, two pipes to be inserted at once and give you a faster progress. Um, the, and now that uh, uh, curved micro tunnels are much more uh, common, uh, you can also use a vertical curvature uh, for some kinds of projects uh, to limit the shaft depths. Um, and then the, the last two bullets, or these two bullets here, are just some options to be aware of that small shafts, um, now you can, can be drilled in su suitable soils. Uh, you can have a vertical uh, uh, drilling machine. Uh, and also um, that uh, there are uh, highly controlled shaft sinking machines that can handle you know, very difficult uh, conditions uh, they, that are now available. One of the critical points of, uh, for a micro tunneling project is when you're either leaving the launching shaft or you are arriving into the reception shaft. And that is a case where particularly if you are below the water table, uh, there is a risk of uh, inrushing water carrying with it some of the ground. Uh, and uh, so there are seals um, uh, made at those entries. And the machine is going to be slightly larger than the pipe. So the, uh, so the seal has to be able to seal on the machine and then also seal on the slightly smaller uh, diameter pipe. And particularly when you're launching well below the water table, uh, you need to make sure that the uh, that when you are going to add a new section of pipe, 
<laughs> that you lock the machine and the first section of pipe uh, to the shaft wall so it can't be pushed back into the shaft <clears throat> by the uh, water pressure. Um, since some of the um, thrust forces can get very large, <clears throat> you need to counter the forces, um, the uh, jacking forces, and that typically is done <clears throat> by um, making an internal um, base uh, on the side of the shaft for the jacks to thrust against, <clears throat> transferring the force through the shaft wall uh, and to the ground around. And uh, that needs to be analyzed uh, uh, by soil mechanics principles. Uh, you may need ground improvement. Uh, and also, since the guidance system often is in the same area at the bottom of the shaft, you need to make sure that the guidance system will not be deviated by any movements uh, of, the, uh, of the support system. <coughs> we'll take a little uh, look at what, uh, in, at least in 1993 in Germany, uh, they found that when they did have problems uh, with microtunneling, uh, what were the, where did those typically occur? And um, you can see that they, uh, most of the failures were either from damaged jacking pipe <coughs> or from a failure of the working place. And um, <coughs> the others were smaller, but included uh, uh, deviation. So, um, of the micro tunnel, in other words, the, either the steering or the guidance was wrong, uh, damaged thrust wall, or break in of groundwater uh, in the starting shaft. So those are some of the things that, that can go wrong. <coughs> Let's just have a quick look at um, some of the effect. For instance, <coughs> if the steering is not very good. Just gonna have to move my picture out of the way. Um, this uh, Stein in his book, which is a very, very good book about micro tunneling. <coughs> the, excuse me, glasses. <coughs> Shows that um, the, um, how you steer a micro tunnel can have an influence on, uh, the how well the steering uh, goes. <laughs> and um, see in this diagram that there's a deviation starts at this first uh, red circle. Uh, and then if the operator waits as they, <clears throat> as they start to steer back to the right line again, uh, if they wait until they get back on the right line <clears throat> and then adjust the steering again, they'll wind up offline. Whereas in fact, you have to anticipate uh, the point uh, to counter steer in order to have the minimum uh, deviation from the correct line and grade. So there's uh, uh, some subtleties to the steering process. <clears throat> I've mentioned that more and more uh, micro tunnels are being done with curved align uh, alignments. Uh, this can allow you to uh, stay within curved streets uh, without adding more shafts to have straight segments in between. Uh, and um, typically what's done is there is a gyroscopic uh, guidance system uh, for the horizontal alignment. And then there is a water level uh, system that is used to provide the vertical control because uh, it can be more accurate. <clears throat> and when that is uh, used, um, uh, you can get some quite complex projects. For instance, a reasonably recent case in Seoul 
in uh, South Korea. It was an 800 meter drive of 2.6 meters internal diameter. And on that drive, that single drive, there were five curves of 200 meters and 250 meters. Uh, and, um, but these systems are uh, at the moment mostly restricted to person entry diameters. So you can see in this case, 2.6 meters ID, uh, because uh, they, you need periodic recalibrations along a long drive uh, or other checks, say hand checks on the alignment. Um, so in the non-person entry diameters, this is still an evolving technology. Um, here's uh, some examples of traditional uh, face support on micro tunneling. I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, the breasting boards where these are can be opened or closed with uh, jacks to provide a face support or sand shelves that provide a kind of frictional resistance uh, to help stabilize the face. And of course, the old but less used today, uh, compressed air. <laughs> the most of the micro tunneling machines uh, today use either uh, slurry uh, for face support, or in the larger diameters, they use an earth pressure balance machine. I think you're probably familiar with those, and so I won't go into uh, any more detail. <laughs> um, how about face uh, pressure on micro tunnels? Um, the, uh, I think you find if you look for the face pressure research, that most of it is with regard to regular tunnel applications. Um, and you'll find far fewer papers that deal specifically with pipe jacking methods. Uh, but there is a paper from the year 2000 uh, that uh, looked at uh, face pressures from 14 micro tunnel drives in France and uh, found that uh, some of the models under predicted face pressures, but if you used uh, normal upper and lower bound estimates, they did in fact cover the range of face pressures that were seen. <clears throat> now, a very important part of um, micro tunneling and pipe jacking is the, um, is the pipe that you're going to use. Uh, and um, particularly if you consider a concrete pipe like this, the quality of the concrete pipe, both in terms of the material uh, and also the precise uh, geometry of the pipe is much uh, more critical than just to get a hold of an ordinary concrete sewer pipe uh, that might be used for open cut and uh, expect that you can use that for pipe jacking. Um, in this case, the pipe is fairly short because this particular project in Germany was being jacked around a curve. Uh, you can see here a, a wooden uh, pressure transfer ring uh, and also the um, uh, a ring here that will uh, uh, take the gaskets that provide a seal uh, with the uh, next section of pipe. So the main design parameters, you know, that you can control when you're designing a micro tunneling project. Uh, some of them. Uh, may come from the uh, from the user requirements, uh, but I'll just run through and uh, mention a few things. Uh, one is that the pipe diameter, if it's to deal with uh, or provide a flow, for instance, is going to be 
specified in terms of the internal diameter. However, the uh, important uh, diameter for choosing the micro tunneling machine is going to be the outside diameter. And uh, the, so uh, you need to be uh, aware when you talk about nominal diameters, you know, uh, that uh, those, there are gonna be those differences. Um, the precise control of line and grade is an advantage of micro tunneling. Uh, and so uh, the grade that the project is on is going to be uh, an important parameter. Um, we've talked about shaft dimensions and obviously the access to the shaft may be important. Um, the um, uh, alignment, uh, also the horizontal alignment, uh, the depth, uh, doesn't impact micro tunneling itself that much. Um, it's going to be uh, more important for the cost and construction of the shafts. Uh, but the drive lengths are very Im important because the drive lengths are going to interact with the maximum jacking force. And that is going to also interact with the pipe diameter and how much jacking force the pipe can take. So uh, traditional concrete pipe has a bell joint. Uh, that is rarely used for pipe jacking, only really uh, on short uh, connections. Uh, it's not uh, recommended at, uh, at all. <laughs> uh, most of the pipe joints are uh, flush joints. You can see in this diagram uh, right here uh, and uh, shows the seals uh, that provide water tightness and also seals here that prevent soil from being forced in underneath uh, the ring. And the idea of the joint design is to provide the maximum area possible for the transfer of force between the two sides, uh, two ends of the pipe. If you check um, uh, this, an older design of jacking pipe uh, and look at the area that's available to transfer the force in this design versus this design, you can see why most of the joints these days are follow this kind of configuration. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the, we don't have time to go into it, but it, uh, an important part of, um, uh, even on straight, uh, nominally straight jobs, if you have you know, steering uh, misdirections, you wind up with the two joints, uh, two ends of the pipe being misaligned. And then you get higher stresses on one side of the pipe uh, than the other. Uh, and there are some very nice, uh, de both design and control systems that have been developed for curved micro tunneling. Uh, and I uh, mentioned uh, the two that I'm familiar with are both from Europe, uh, Kojak uh, and Jack Control. One is from Switzerland and one is from uh, Germany. And uh, they not only have very nice design and control software, uh, but uh, they also uh, have developed fluid build host systems that help to even the uh, transfer of forces uh, between the two sides of the pipe to avoid uh, pipe fracture. Because if you think if you wind up fracturing the end of a pipe in the middle of a micro tunneling run because your jacking forces are too high uh, for the pipe, 
it's a very uh, expensive and difficult proposition to either uh, replace that pipe or to repair it. <clears throat> now, typically if you're bringing pipe by road from somewhere else, maybe the maximum size is about somewhere in the area of three meters diameter. If you need larger pipes than that, uh, they in Japan, they use even more than four meter diameter pipes by splitting the pipes longitudinally for transportation and then joining them together uh, on site. Or uh, you can, as we mentioned earlier, have a uh, rectangular section. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the um, control of settlements, because um, that's always an issue or a concern for tunneling projects. And we can divide the settlements into two main areas, what, the, what we call the systematic settlements. Uh, these are the ones that uh, are likely to occur through the normal progress of the project. And then the unanticipated settlements, which means these are ones that shouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, they uh, are um, not expected. And they, since they're not expected, uh, they can be wind up being quite large and uncontrolled. Um, so the systematic settlements. Uh, I will just mention the main sources. Uh, you can read the, the other ones, but the annular space around the uh, uh, shield and the pipe are always going to be there because there's always a small annular uh, space. Uh, also, uh, whether there is any ground loss uh, or even eave uh, at the uh, face, is something that needs to be included. And then when you steer the micro tunneling, you, it's inevitable that as you steer, the machine is actually gonna actually increase the amount of soil that is uh, removed and it's gonna slightly increase the, uh, the uh, over excavation, if you like. Um, on the other hand, the unanticipated settlements uh, typically come to poor shaft uh, exit or entry procedures uh, where the face control is basically lost. Uh, and in certain mixed face conditions where it becomes extremely difficult to excavate, let's say, rock in part of the face without allowing an over-excavation of soil in another part of the face. <clears throat> so um, we can avoid a uh, large settlement with good practices and understanding of causes. Uh, and very often, even though we can make predictions of systematic settlements, uh, they often turn out to be lower uh, in practice uh, because uh, the annular space is not just open, but it's filled with lubrication mud. Uh, and also a void around the tunnel or pipe uh, is, um, does not necessarily transfer to the surface because the uh, soil expands in volume as it uh, settles into that open space. Probably one of the most important areas for a micro tunneling and uh, pipe jacking project is the estimation of the uh, jacking load. Uh, and the two main parts of that, as we showed earlier, uh, is the uh, face pressure, which remains relatively uh, constant. Uh, you have to overcome the, uh, the uh, you have to support the face and you have to provide enough thrust to generate 
the cutting reaction allows you to cut the uh, soil. Uh, and that face support is likely to be at least the active pressure and hopefully significantly less than the passive pressure um, that you can estimate at the face. Uh, and there's also going to be the water pressure as well. And then the friction and adhesion along the pipe is going to be made up of components of sliding the machine weight through the ground, the pipe weight of its, uh, itself, uh, and oh, the subtracted from the pipe weight, the buoyancy of putting an empty pipe uh, below the water table in the ground. And sometimes the pipe is actually uh, uh, more buoyant than it overcomes the weight of the pipe and you get more friction from the buoyancy uh, than, uh, than from the pipe weight. Uh, then if the soil is collapsing around the pipe, uh, you are going to get uh, lateral soil pressures on the pipe, uh, and those are going to cause additional friction. So those lateral soil pressures are going to be affected by the amount of overcut that you make, and also by what you're doing with the lubrication mud that goes within the annular space. And then curved pipe jacking uh, are going to affect that also. So uh, this gives you a, a list of um, how you can calculate the frictional components. Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. And um, you should have a copy of this um, presentation, so I won't go through these terms one by one. I just explained them on the previous slide. I might take a little more uh, time on this one because <clears throat> the typically our soil mechanics techniques will um, um, will want to make some uniform assumptions about radial pressure, for instance. Uh, but typically what's gonna happen is that the pressures are going to be quite uneven around the uh, circumference of the pipe, more like this than, than like this. And if you're excavating in a stiff clay, it's quite possible that if the opening stays stable for a while, that you actually really are just sliding the pipe through a stable uh, opening. And um, so the, the actual conditions are very um, uh, difficult to, uh, to estimate. Um, we can make rough estimates. Um, they probably, by say, averaging vertical and horizontal effective stresses and using that as a radial pressure. Um, it's important to remember that since the water pressure itself does not add a frictional component, uh, then we need to use effective. Uh, stresses rather than total stresses. And I realize I'm <clears throat> running out of time here, so I want to uh, jump ahead a little bit um, and say to deal with it, you know, uh, or uh, deal with or ignore uh, this complexity, most uh, jobs for pipe jacking and micro tunneling are designed uh, with a, an average uh, frictional resistance calculation. So the total frictional resistance R is this symbol M, which is a sort of lumped parameter for the skin friction. And then pi D L is basically the external surface area of the pipe. So, um, 
by D is the circumference and L is the, the length. So this M is a value uh, per unit uh, area uh, of the skin friction. <clears throat> and um, how can we estimate what that M might be? Well, people have done um, uh, frictional tests on materials like concrete against different types of uh, soil and come up with a range of frictional coefficients. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because typically when you use these values, you're going to grossly overestimate uh, the amount of uh, friction that you would have to overcome in a real project. And we'll talk about why uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, also, that same book I mentioned before, uh, Stein um, from 2005, uh, has a table in his book that shows some of the published, uh, these M values. And what I want you to notice uh, here is that um, the values that have been published range from as much as 100 uh, here in this uh, research uh, to as low as uh, five uh, for lubrication, lubricated microtunneling jobs uh, from Stein, and even as low as the 5.7 minus four or 1.7 uh, that was found by uh, Weber. And so with a, with a huge range, what are you going to uh, assume as a, as a designer? And this is one of the bigger challenges, I think, for uh, microtunneling project uh, designers. Um, <laughs> and one of the big uh, variables um, that explains a lot of the variation is the use of lubrication. And here we can see uh, David Bennett when he did his uh, uh, PhD thesis uh, uh, quite a few years uh, ago, um, found that when he collected data from lubricated drives and from non-lubricated drives, these were the uh, jacking forces from lubricated drives uh, with this kind of lower trend line. And these were the jacking forces from non-lubricated drives uh, on this uh, much steeper trend line. Uh, and with this being jacking force versus distance from the uh, drive shaft. And particularly the yellow dots uh, uh, are most instructive because here is a project that started out non-lubricated on this trend line. And then when they realized that jacking forces were going to go too high, then they started to lubricate and then it followed the lower trend line. So there is a you dem demonstrable impact of the uh, lubrication. Um, there have been various uh, researchers to look at real jacking loads versus different predictions. And this is one that's done uh, using uh, or reporting the different um, estimations here, and then uh, reporting what the actual jacking load was. And as you can see, it tends to be towards the bottom end of the predictions. And it also tends to be a little higher, nearer the beginning of the drive. <clears throat> um, this is a fairly recent uh, uh, project um, done around, I think, 2015, 2016. Uh, it's called the uh, Gombe project uh, and uh, uh, in the Shenzhen area of China. This was a um, 
I think I, I showed you the <clears throat> picture with the multiple micro tunnels uh, for creating the big 20 meter diameter uh, tunnel. Um, and these were actually curved micro tunnels. So you would expect the jacking loads to be uh, um, higher than normal, uh, but they really paid a lot of attention to minimizing the jacking loads. Um, their code that they compared it to was uh, the Shanghai code from 2008. And that was this red line here. The actual jacking loads field measured follow this black line. And the peaks are things like machine stoppage uh, and also the braking uh, into the uh, shaft uh, wall uh, near the end of the uh, project. Um, and if you look at the uh, sort of uh, the bottom envelope of the jacking loads, uh, this is only 0.23 uh, kilopascals. And so this is you know, essentially equivalent to the uh, to that M factor. So, even though you've got uh, uh, a long curved micro tunnel, the basic trend of the jacking forces is extremely low, uh, and it's only the specific uh, you know sort of uh, problem areas that have caused the jacking loads to spike. <clears throat> so we can um, say that these following parameters are what affect the jacking load. Uh, and of these, the uh, lubrication and the ability to maintain the fluid conditions around the pipe uh, are very important. Uh, as uh, the delays and stoppages. And so this keeping an adequate pressure and flow of the lubrication fluid uh, the versus the fact you're going to lose some into the ground uh, is very important. Uh, and also if the ground is tending to uh, dewater the lubrication mud, then that is going to uh, have a big impact uh, as well. <clears throat> One of the things that we can do to uh, provide an insurance, if you like, to have enough jacking force uh, without overloading any particular, either the jacks or particular sections of pipe, is to put in these intermediate jacking stations. Um, they uh, typically can only be used uh, where it's person entry diameter because the jacks are removed uh, at the end of the uh, end of the project run, uh, and the uh, pipes are then closed up to make uh, to complete the uh, the pipe run. And you can put in more of them uh, and, you know, they're an insurance, even if you don't actually have to use them. So um, we um, this slide talks about the use of the slurry or the uh, mud in, in micro tunneling. Um, I'm going to leave aside the excavation and face support. That's similar to its use in normal tunneling. Uh, but the uh, lubrication effect is the important part for micro tunneling and uh, pipe jack. Uh, it's uh, very important in reducing the friction on the jacking pipe. <clears throat> it also fills the annular space so it can reduce settlements. Uh, it can prevent moisture changes in swelling soils that would otherwise swell to grip the pipe. Uh, and it gives you uh, a more even contact pressure to get 
smoother shanking loads. <clears throat> so there's a lot of text on this slide and um, um, I think I will leave uh, you this slide to read if you like at a later uh, uh, time and just point out that um, a couple of uh, things. Uh, one, there are there is some information in the literature on how much steering quality affects the friction coefficient. Uh, and the published data indicates that it affects it much more on long drives than on short drives. Um, and there's also some indications of what you can expect in terms of increases in jacking load after delays. So if you're planning a project, uh, the, it's important to try and make sure that the actual micro tunneling run can be done without stoppages, without breaks over uh, public holidays, for instance, because then you'll come back and you will in all likelihood have much higher mm -hmm. jacking load. <clears throat> We've mentioned the importance of lubrication. Uh, and um, uh, so researchers have expected that bentonite acts as a lubricant uh, and that it, perhaps it uh, mixes with the uh, soil, uh, providing a material with a lower friction angle, uh, that the uh, lubricant might make the pipe more buoyant uh, and hence reduce the friction loads, uh, and also that the lubricant uh, can reduce the effective stress in the soil by increasing the fluid pressure. Uh, and in fact, it's that last one that has, you know, been found to uh, uh, be significant in some of the research. Uh, the other thing that the studies of janking forces have found uh, is that uh, there is very often a, a spike of the janking loads early in a janking project. And the uh, feeling is that that has come from incomplete lubrication of the annular space during the early stages of uh, pipe jacking. And a lot of the research has indicated that if you make sure you have uh, adequate fluid volumes, then you will wind up with uh, lower jacking loads. Um, the various researchers have also looked at how much can you expect the jacking force to decrease with lubrication, uh, and uh, that ranges from as much as 90% uh, to uh, uh, more conservative estimates that you can reduce it only 25 to 30%. Uh, I would say that that whole range is possible. Uh, it depends on the quality of the lubrication, the volumes used, and also what the initial estimates uh, were. Uh, but that Gong Bay project gives an example that um, uh, you can have extremely low um, frictional forces if the project is, is well designed and executed. Um, curved alignments, obviously more complicated to estimate. Uh, and I'm really, I'm not going to, um, to try and discuss that in, in detail, but you can expect it to be higher, obviously, than in a straight alignment. So what can we expect in terms of future uh, developments? Uh, I think we've seen over the past number of years the, uh, that uh, longer drives are being undertaken and successfully completed. Uh, that allows you to reduce sharp costs. Um, there are going to be more and more curved micro 
tunnel drives and gyroscopic guidance systems, I think are going to become uh, more feasible in the non-person entry uh, diameter uh, ranges. Uh, there's also work on looking ahead of micro tunneling machines and even directional drilling to try and sense obstacles and, uh, and ground conditions. Um, more use of hybrid excavation techniques, uh, both at the micro tunnel scale and also <clears throat> applying those techniques to large scale excavation systems. Um, some of the, the areas of application of the methods are overlapping more and more, and that is going to allow greater competition among related methods. Uh, and all of those. Uh, continuing, I think, to provide greater cost effectiveness versus open cut. <clears throat> so to conclude then, um, much of the technical development in this field has really been made by the manufacturers and uh, in conjunction with the contractors uh, doing the uh, work. Um, but there's also an important uh, uh, com contribution, if you like, from such things as uh, improved materials, better computing power and software and, and other uh, things like that. <clears throat> but um, the researchers that are dealing specifically with uh, tunneling and micro tunneling fields uh, are also um, working to improve our knowledge of the interactions that are going on as part of the pipe jacking processes uh, so that we can have better predictions of jacking loads, face pressures, and uh, ground movements. Um, and as in, in most fields, if you want to go um, uh, beyond where we are today, uh, people have to be willing to uh, try something a little different and uh, uh, take the risk that goes along with that. Um, so <clears throat> that's the uh, end of the lecture. And I see that uh, I have a couple of, uh, of chats and a couple of uh, Q&As. Um, so back to you, uh, um, Miguel, to... Um, Yes, th thank you very much, Dr. Sterling, for this very interesting talk, this great overview of microtunneling and, and pipe jacking. Uh, indeed, we have some questions that uh, if, if, you, if you are willing, we can address them. Uh, but before addressing the questions, I, I would like just to uh, make... Uh, uh, Marco, can, can I share my, my screen? Please. Yes, let me uh, stop sharing my screen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I'm uh, just a brief mention. We would like to thank. Uh, are you seeing my screen now, right? Yes. Yes, just, just a, a, a brief thank you to the company Vesac, which was the sponsor of this uh, seminar. It's a company with more than 40 years of experience in the construction of tunnels and micro tunnels for for various applications. So we, we would like to thank BESAC for sponsor, sponsoring this seminar. So now we can move to the, to the questions, if you like. So we will start by a question from Alex Garzon, which first of all, thanks the excellent presentation and would like to know your opinion regarding the, the future of these emerging methods and new patents for uh, implementing new technologies in the installation of, of trenchless uh, of trenches technologies, of trenches uh, pipes. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you, you can hear me now, right? Uh, I Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I think I tried to uh, address that with the last, um, you know, one or two uh, uh, slides. Um, 
the um, that there, uh, even though the methods now have been around for fifty or sixty uh, years, uh, they are still uh, evolving, and uh, uh, you know the the continual improvements. Maybe the you know the major part of the uh, of the methods are fairly well set, but um, uh, for instance, uh, I think still you know quite significant improvements in the guidance you know as i mentioned for curve micro tunneling and i believe that we're starting to have a better handle on the on the lubrication uh you know uh, the uh what you can do to really lower the jacking uh forces um um but you know, it's also important that the contractors, um, you know, understand and, uh, you know, follow the recommendations because, you know, on some micro tunneling projects, um, they in clays, for instance, a uh, contractor uh, has tried to use uh, just uh, water uh, for the uh, slurry. Uh, uh, and uh, rather than using a bentonite slurry, for instance, because it's a lot uh, cheaper. And uh, under some conditions, uh, that could be the most cost-effective way to do the job, but it's, it's much more risky because um, the, uh, the chance of uh, face collapse or over-excavation or other problems come along. So. Sometimes we we know what the problems are, but um, uh, making sure that the job is done in a way that's not too risky is also important. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another, well, it's not a question, it's just uh, uh, Alex Garzon wants to know if you know about uh, a, a pie jacking project in Bogota, Colombia. Apparently, it will be 8.7 kilometers long with, uh, with, with, the, with the diameter of 60 inches and with a uh, shaft every, 50, uh, every 500 meters. So apparently, it's going to be the, the longest in the world of this diameter, just if, if you are aware of, of the project. Um, uh, no, actually, I'm not uh, aware of that. I do have, uh, you know, uh, uh, people that I know uh, in uh, in Colombia and uh, in the trenchless uh, field, but um, um, I think I might have heard about it when it was in the planning stage. But um, uh, I'm I'm not familiar uh, with it. No, but it sounds like a very interesting project. Um, I didn't mention it in the um, presentation, but the longest. Uh, Pipe jacking uh, run in a single run uh, was done quite a few years ago in Germany, and it was 2.5 kilometers for a three meter, it's a three meter inside diameter pipe, and it was done on an outfall uh, project on the coast in Germany. So. Again, when you uh, pay careful attention to jacking loads and thrust forces, you can do uh, very long single runs uh, with pipe jacking. Thank you very much. Uh, Nancy Quintero asks if you can uh, jack a pipes of, well, uh, it, it, she's asking uh, steel. You, you already mentioned that in your presentation, but she also asked about fiberglass if it is possible to 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 do pipe jacking with with uh, fiberglass pipes um <clears throat> yes the the answer is uh, is yes there is a very popular form of um of pipe for pipe jacking which is uh centrifugally cast uh uh, uh basically uh, uh fiberglass pipe is fiber and uh, resin, um, and the manufacturer's name uh, is Hobas. 
but there are also other fiberglass uh, pipes. Um, there are also polymer concrete pipes that are used. Uh, there are steel pipes uh, that get welded. And there are also steel pipes that are uh, configured uh, with a interlocking joint so that where the two steel pipes uh, fit together, uh, that reduces the uh, on-site time, uh, which is quite long for welding large steel pipes. Uh, also in the smaller diameters, uh, clay pipes uh, that are specially made for jacking. And I'm probably missing some other kinds of pipes. So the important thing is to, uh, to make sure that the uh, what the thrust uh, capability of the pipe is, uh, and the, including the fact that the pipe the loads may not be perfectly concentric in the field, even if you are not going around a uh, a curve. So, um, yeah, I hope I maybe hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from Roberto Gonzalez, which is actually uh, a member of the steering committee here in Amitos. He says, Dr. Sterling, thanks for the interesting presentation. How common is having to make a hyperbaric intervention to change these cutters on, uh, or soft ground tools in the middle of the drive or longer drive? For example, in case of experiencing Experiencing high torque or cutter head blockage, it seems that the space for personnel entering the excavation chamber is very tight. Um, yes, very, very good question. And one that I, I didn't have enough time to, to, to get into, but um, yes, one of the things with a micro uh, tunnel project is that actually the smaller diameters, although you would expect to have less soil, you know, tunnel collapse problems, for instance, uh, there's a, often a bit more risk in the small projects because you don't have access to get a person to the face to do anything. So when you launch the, uh, the micro tunneling machine, uh, if you don't manage to get to the reception shaft uh, because you run into an obstruction or your cutters uh, wear faster than you anticipated, then you really are stuck. Uh, but as soon as you get to the diameters where it's possible to have a person go to the front of the machine, and it's possible to change the cutter heads or to have a say a hyperbaric intervention uh, where you can go through a, a little prepared port in the front to remove or cut away an obstruction uh, then you know your uh, your risk of getting stuck actually goes down so um I, I can't tell you how, what proportion of projects uh, that can have prepared to do that actually do it. I, I don't know that figure, but uh, it is certainly a worry uh, for uh, micro tunneling projects uh, that you uh, run into obstacles that can't be, uh, can't be handled by the machine. And, and that translates back, for instance, into the geotechnical investigation uh, in that some consultants require uh, basically a large uh, auger uh, type soil investigation down you know, to the level of the micro tunneling project uh, just to be able to bring up a better sampling of the soil, including cobbles, and boulders uh, that would be hard to estimate what you had if you were doing the typical small diameter uh, soil um, uh, borehole. 
So hopefully that that will uh, answer the question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from Miguel Angel Perrichon. He uh, thanks for the very clear presentation and asks, what are your recommendations when a TVM gets stuck at the middle of the of the drive, and there is no possibility to construct an intermediate uh, rescue shaft? Um, okay, well, <clears throat> it uh, depends a lot on on where the uh, machine has been able to advance to. Uh, typically, uh, you know, one of the possibilities, if it's close to the arrival shaft, is actually to do hand tunneling from the uh, arrival shaft back towards the um, uh, back towards the machine. I think, in fact, although I, I'm not absolutely sure about it, I think that sometimes some pipe ramming of a of a large steel pipe has been done to uh, sort of drive back to intercept the machine. Uh, it's also possible to, if there's a sharp location off to the side of the drive, to sink a shaft down and then tunnel over uh, to the machine. And some micro tunneling machines uh, actually have been designed that to be retractable, so they can actually pull back the machine and remove the pipes that you installed behind it as you pull it back, uh, so that uh, you can uh, retrieve the machine. And I think generally in that case, they are also pumping in a, a weak grout to hold the ground as you pull the machine back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from Jose Angel Castro. He's also a member of the steering committee of, of AMITO and he's a specialist in, in instrumenting. That, that's why the, 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 he has this question. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Dr. Sterling. How common is to install concrete instrumented concrete segments during pipe jacking and what are the most common instruments? Mm. Um, yes, I, uh, uh, I'd say it's not that common. Uh, they, there's quite a bit of work to, um, to measure jacking loads. Um, they, I think there have also been some work to try and and monitor the gap across at pipe joints, uh, and um, the um, uh, yeah. But I, you know, you can use uh, strain gauges. Um, obviously, uh, you know, for the wet conditions, very often vibrating wire strain gauges. Um, I remember rightly, uh, uh, sort of can have some advantages, but actually I, I used to do a fair amount of instrumentation related work, but uh, that was quite a while ago. So I'm not sure if uh, the some of the techniques have, uh, have changed, but um, the things you really want to know are, um, the pressure of the lubrication fluid at different points along the um, along the drive to uh, make sure that you got enough lubrication volumes, uh, stresses on the uh, concrete pipe, uh, total jacking loads, uh, the good um, information on the movement, uh, you know uh, the alignment of the pipe, all those things. Very good. There is also a, a question from Jose Angel. Uh, he asked when uh, a TVM machine is used, what is the best guidance system? And uh, a second part of the question is if the position of the, of the uh, hydraulic jacks 
for the for the jacking has an influence in the uh, in the direction of the of, of in the guidance of the of the of the pipe um yes i um uh I think that you know a normal the normal guidance system is uh, is a laser based system if the micro tunnel is straight and the longer the distances you go the beam spreads and uh, it's also vulnerable to thermal uh, layering um, along the job so if you have person entry diameter. Uh, you want to it's always a good idea to um to supplement the um laser system or the curved uh the gyroscopic system uh with uh uh calibration checks using hand surveying or uh automated uh theodolites um if it's um smaller than person diameter uh you know if uh, you're you're really you have to rely on the on the system, but you can, for instance, in the terms of the vertical control, as I said, use a water level system to give you accurate uh, vertical guidance. Okay, uh, and there is a question from Johnny Villavicencio. Uh, in terms of precast lining design. What is the dominant force, jacking forces or vertical ground load when we are considering uh, lubrication along the, the, the shaft, the, ton the tunnel? Sorry. I'd say uh, in most uh, or, or almost all micro tunneling pipe jacking projects, the design of the, uh, of the pipe and the, the axial loads are the dominant one. The lateral loads are much typically less significant okay uh I, I have a question of my own maybe the last one we already went for, for, through all of them uh in when when the pipe is not lubricated we saw in the in the uh, in situ measurements that you get more or less as expected a, a linear increase of the jacking force with the distance because we are increasing the the, the contact areas we put a, a new section but when when the the data that you saw of lubricated pipes, what I should expect is that this friction get reduced and you get a, a similar linear trend, but with a with a smaller slope. But what you show is that more or less the load get stabilizes at some value, and the slope is very 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 gentle, almost uh, it's almost horizontal. So it's. I would expect at least some linear increase of the load because we are adding area to the to the problem, but it seems that it 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 balances at, at some point, right? No, I think if you look at the you know there is a slope. It's a very low slope, as you say, uh, but there is the 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 low the lower bound of the of the graph is definitely has a slope. And if you remember the uh, the data from Bennett's thesis, that there, you know, were the two lines, and one with no lubrication and one with uh, lubrication, and both of them showed, you know, a slope. So, I think the the Chinese project one just showed that they uh, just did a superb job to. Um, uh, to make sure that they had lots of lubrication volume and pressure and they were in a soft soil anyway and um, they were just able to keep their uh, uh, frictional forces down to a very low level correct and and i guess that it, basically you generally show that uh, uh the the jacking force is usually overestimated right so I, I can imagine that the 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 number of projects where you get the the equipment stuck in the ground because you don't have enough jacking forces should be minimum right or 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 they are frequent 
I I don't know that they're frequent, but it does happen. Uh, and uh, you know, generally, it's probably bad practices that uh, uh, something really unexpected that uh, something wasn't picked up by the site investigation. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is one last question, maybe we, we are uh, quite uh, late in time, but just maybe the last one is just about the recommended distance between between shaft uh, in, in, in usual uh, micro tunneling projects. Yes, I, I um, uh, have to I think, you know, somewhere in the range of a 100 to 200 meters is, is, you know, probably pretty typical. It tends to increase um, with years as the years go by, uh, because people get a little more confident about going further. Uh, also, one thing to remember is that the safe distances for a larger diameter height are much longer than for the smaller diameter pipes. They have a better thrust capability. And also once you get into the person entry diameters, you have more options to deal with things like cut ahead wear and other things like that. Perfect. So I, I think we can stop now. Uh, just to, to answer the Juan Carlos question, no, we generally don't give uh, 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 assistance uh, diplomas for these seminars, which are open. So this this was a question also in the chat. So we I think we can conclude the seminar now. So Dr. Sterling, yeah. thank you thank you very much for accepting this invitation. It was an amazing overview of, of micro tunneling and pipe jacking. Uh, we, we hope that we will have you in the future for some other events if, if you if you like. Okay, I'd be pleased to. So yes, thank you for inviting me and it's been a pleasure to uh, to interact with all of you. So goodbye to everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you also very much for uh, all the assistance. And again, thank you to Besak for sponsoring this, this seminar. And I hope that everyone have a very nice afternoon. And again, thank you, Dr. Sterling, for this very, very nice seminar and for answering all these interesting questions for uh, from the audience. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone.